So we talk about feeding the bees because it's winter time and there's no food. But that's not really true. Maybe there's just not enough food. So that's why we feed. So this is going to be really interesting because I haven't given this talk in a while. And I studied my whole binder month, my whole presentation. And then I thought, I better check right before I left. And the presentation I have is totally different than the one I've been studying. <laughs> okay? So it's going to be, we'll, we'll make it work. The one thing I don't tell everybody is that um, I was also a member of the Brother Buzz Club. Oh, no. You remember the Brother Buzz <laughs> Club? <laughs> of course, I was like in the third grade, but that was a long time ago. Anyway, um, I'm glad it, I thought, you know, maybe there was free beer with everybody here, but apparently <laughs> not. Anyway, so tonight we're going to talk about uh, plants and bees and feeding them. I guess I aimed this at the machine. Um, before you are forced to feed, this is my homemade bee feeder. It's sugar water in the bottom half of a hummingbird feeder. It took them 30 minutes to find it, and they would empty it every hour. I was filling it. So, um, yeah. And I, this was probably January. So we're going to get a little bit of history, and um, does anybody know when the first honeybees were brought to San Jose? In the 30s. 1800 something? According to John Muir, he wrote a paper, um, The Mountains of California, in 1894. The first bees were brought into California in 1853. The man bought 12 hives. They all died but one. The one that survived he brought to San Jose in 1854, and then he was murdered. I don't know what that plays into. And they sold the hive and split, and so he sold the two existing hives. Now it's 1854, and one hive sold for 105 bucks and the other for 110. So these have been here in this valley. 100, 200 years. Yes. Do you know what kind of bees they were? They were what the uh, family they were in? He called them brown bees. <laughs> <laughs> you know, John Muir, a man of many words. Um, but I just want to read you really quick the opening to this uh, chapter in this book. He called it the Bee Pastures. And he says, when California was wild, it was one sweet bee garden throughout the entire length, north and south, and all the way across from the snowy Sierra to the ocean. If you're kind of a romantic and you like poetic writing, this is a really good document to get. It's The name of the book is called The Mountains of California, and you can download it for free, and I shouldn't put that there. Anyway, so we've all seen this. We all know what this is. This is black mustard although it looks yellow, it's called black mustard. It was brought here by the Jesuits when they started planting the orchards in the fields, and it was brought here to encourage pollination. Mm -hmm. So we have these wild hives of honeybees that had broken loose from hives that we had domesticated, and, um, but to bring in the native bees, because California, we didn't have any honeybees here. So, um, see what this next one is. So plant diversity is essential. Uh, we've learned that um, the bees have a tendency to eat all of one plant, get the nectar and the pollen from one plant before they move on to another variety. So unless you want to have a whole yard of nothing but um, Daphne or California poppy, something like that, you need to have some diversity so that they they keep busy, they keep foraging. There are certain plants that do better in the summertime and some that do better in the springtime. Before we get started into too much detail, how many of you are gardeners? 
How many pe people keep bees to <coughs> pollinate their fruit trees in Finland? Okay, so you know what we're talking about here. It's really, really critical. So when we talk about Mediterranean plants, we're talking about plants that grow on the western coast at these latitudes. So these are all considered Mediterranean plants. When you buy a plant and it says it's from Australia, you say, that's not where the Mediterranean is. But that's what that term means. So when you're in the nursery and we're talking about Mediterranean plants, we're talking about plants that grow in that latitude with the western coast influence. And if you have any questions, just yell them out as we go along. I am a master gardener. I do have a tendency to go on and on. OK. Well, the honeybees and the dandelions were introduced from Europe. The French brought them here when they brought the snails. <laughs> um, thank you. We just came back from a, a trip to uh, Nova Scotia. And the lawns are nothing but dandelions. We just recently saw a picture come through on the internet of a dead honeybee whose legs were full <coughs> of pollen, but was eating dandelions that had been mm -hmm. had a spray on them to kill the dandelions, the weed and feed. So when you when you're going to make a commitment. For these insects, you have to make sure you have no pesticides, no herbicides, no fungicides, no cytocides. Just really, really pay attention. And it's really helpful if you make sure your neighbors do the same. I tell my neighbors, I'll give you a jar of honey. Because we're in a residential area. Our house is in a court. And my, neighbor, my driveway is 25 feet wide, and the hive is 25 feet from the street. The mailman, the UPS man, they go by it every day. I have to keep my bees happy. So let's let's not kill the dandelions. But today, when I went looking for dandelions, I had to go to an abandoned bank building <laughs> on Hamilton <laughs> Avenue uh, because there's no dandelions. Nobody has them anymore. And just think how easy they they reseed. And the one thing is that the, the leaves are very edible in a salad, and you can make wine out of them. This is my front yard. Nice. You'll notice that there's not much growing in the front. Do you know why? Because in the morning when you get up, what's the first thing you do? You head to the john, right? These bees have been in this hive all night long, and the first thing they do when they leave is poop. They're not going to eat food that they pooped on. So there's no sense planting a big floral garden for the bees in front of the hive. So you want to give them 20 feet of nothing to, to pollinate or use for food. This was taken, I don't even know when that was taken. So, so bee poop isn't fertilizer then? No. <laughs> and it's not good on your windshield either. <laughs> So, and there's not probably enough of it to make fertilizer. So some points I want you to consider is I want you to think like the bee, think how they work. Uh, plant your plants in groups of five or 10. It, it doesn't work to have one plant here and a different plant here and a different plant there. Um, full sun in a protected area. If there's a lot of wind, like between the two houses of you and your neighbor, you'll have a wind tunnel. Fragrance is only important to night pollinators, but bees have a very, very keen sense of smell. So I, um, I have an African blue basil that can't be propagated from seed, can only be propagated <coughs> by live cuttings. But I keep it in my greenhouse to get it through the winter. It's covered with flowers. And right now, I took the pot out and put it near the hive, and it took them less than eight minutes to find this stuff. Mm. And they're all over it. You can pass it around. Mm. So that's what I can smell. 
but what you've probably been smelling too is uh, Daphne. This whole thing spilled on me in the car, so. Mm -hmm. This is Daphne. It's probably a plant that your mother grew. Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult plant to grow, and it's, um, it starts blooming like a week before Christmas, and it's still blooming. Mm -hmm. And it has the most amazing fragrance, and the bees absolutely love it. Wow. So you very old fashioned. Smell. It's very old fashioned. So you have to remember, you know, if you want plants that are going to bloom in the winter time, you have to plant them in the summertime. And avoid the flight pattern. And I've already told you, I'm not going to be on the soapbox too much about that. How important is pollination? Very important. Very important. Tomatoes are wind pollinated. But just about everything else in your vegetable garden is pollinated by insects, especially honeybees. They're very, very busy. Um, the melons, we wouldn't have melons without honeybees. And the fruit trees, I mean, when you think about how many people or how many thousands, tens of thousands of hives are in the Central Valley waiting for the almonds to pop right now. And the sad thing is, is those, those bees will pollinate. And then when they're done, a lot of the beekeepers just dump the hives because they don't care. They've made so much money from working their bees, they don't care about the honey. <coughs> so let's talk a little bit about flowers. And I don't want to insult anybody, but this is a real important thing that you understand, is where the nectar comes from in this part of the plant, the stigma and the anthers, is that's where we're going to produce the pollen. So most of the plants are created by nature so that the bee will pass through the pollen to get to the nectar. Drones do not gather nectar. They don't do that kind of work. Okay. Some, let's see here. <coughs> Willow is the highest quality pollen you can find around. So if you're in an area, that, the riparian area on a creek, Guadalupe or Las Gatas or any of the creeks around here, the willows that grow in there are real critical to our bee population. And we'll get a lot of swarms going down into these creek beds because they are close to that pollen source. This slide is very important because it tells you when the pollen plants are most productive. June, May, April. And the uh, nectar plants. So you can see after October, they don't even put it on the chart because the amount of pollen and nectar that's produced in our gardens is so minimal. That's why it's real important to have a balanced garden when, how many people have lived in this area more than 50 years? <laughs> you know what it used to be like when we used to walk to school and it was like snow with all the blossoms on the ground. Well, where are the bees going? I mean, they're moving down here, which is good, <laughs> to Gilroy. But we have a real issue with keeping them fed. 30,000 bees on average in a hive. That's a lot of mouths to feed. And if we, as beekeepers, take away their food in the winter time, your, your hive is going to really struggle and probably starve. You're going to lose a lot of bees. And we've learned that mostly when it starts being fall and they're not, there's not as much food, the honey's been taken, they start kicking the drones out because they really don't need them anymore. One less mouth to feed. So. Pay attention to this chart and what's it, when is it really important. We don't need to worry about planting bee plants in the summertime. Unfortunately, that's when we get all the beauty in our garden. Any questions? Yeah, can I take a picture of that? Sure. Okay. Okay, go. 
and, and I'll be more than happy to give you a um, copy of it. Thank you. So, there's different types of flowers. Some flowers are much more receptive to bees. <coughs> Excuse me. I think the number one flower for attracting bees in my garden is the sunflowers. Big flat. Excuse me. When you think about a plant like a camellia that are blooming right now, they're just gorgeous. How do you get to the nectar? How do you get to the pollen? There's no way. It's buried. So these are beautiful in your garden, and I grow them, I love them. They're, you know, they're like, to me, spring is around the corner. They're almost like a spittle bug. They're gonna be there. But they're not a good plant for bees. Mm -hmm. You want flowers that are open and that are welcoming. Remember, bees don't see red. They see UV. When they see red, they see a gray type color. <coughs> but it's usually in such a way, the way the flower is, is that it draws the insect into where the nectar and pollen is. So you've all grown calla lilies, or at least seen them, and this whole part right here will be covered with pollen. It makes it real easy for the bees to get to. When do the callas bloom? Early spring, and then as soon as it gets warm, they're done. <coughs> So another really good flower, or the, that's an artichoke, and I have a um, bottle brush, <clears throat> and my bottle brush flower, this is left over, <laughs> will get about this long, and I will have 30 <coughs> bees rummaging through here like monkeys looking for salt, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so a bottle brush is a really good pollen producing plant to have in your garden, and they have a variety of um, bottle brush now that doesn't get any taller than this. And it'll bloom for months, three months, four months. But doesn't it produce a smaller bottle brush flower, the, the miniature ones? I, it has been my experience. <coughs> my, my flowers, this is not a classic example. Yeah. <laughs> this is, but I, still, I only had about four flowers on my whole shrub. Um, but yeah, it, they seem to produce the same standard size yeah. blossom. Yeah, sure, and I've got those as well, and they, they are really good active producers. The bees love yes, the bottle do. brush. I think it's because the nectar is um, it's laid out in between the, the, the petals, if you will call them. Is it an annual or a perennial bottle brush? Bottle brush is a uh, perennial. perennial. It's there forever. And the other comment I make about the artichokes, if you live over in this area, it's, it's great to grow the artichokes because as soon as it gets hot, they bolt and you get the flowers, you don't get any artichokes to eat. So the ones you get are about the size of a golf ball. Mm -hmm. And they're very beautiful. They are. The, the bees just forage through them. Mm -hmm. It's just fun to watch them. Now, I don't know, this is the slide of the show that I wasn't familiar with, so. This pestamen right here, it's very interesting because a honeybee has a very short proboscis, a very short snout to get to. Uh, the, the pollen and nectar, and that's why it likes a flat surfaced, like the, this is a chamomile. Have you ever grown chamomile? It takes over your whole garden. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be careful when a master gardener says, would you like some of that? It's everywhere in my garden. <laughs> it's only a matter of time before it's everywhere in your garden. So, um, but it's a plant, it's a an herb is uh, medicinal. But what these bees will do, which I've seen them, especially the native bees, the, the uh, uh, bumblebees, is they'll come down here and they'll drill a hole mm -hmm. oh. and go right in to get the nectar. <laughs> smart. Very smart. We talk about adaption, right? So um, these are hummingbirds at the nursery now. And I don't know if it's on this slide or not, but um, if we can get into the trunk of the car. <laughs> um, the, because the federal government has come down, or the state of California, really hard on neonics and pesticides, now they have bee-friendly plants. 
And if you go into the nursery, there'll be a plant marker and it'll have a little yellow honeybee on it. So you know it's a good plant for bees. But what they found in the big box stores, Lowe's, Home Depot, that type of a setting, 80% of the plants are GMO. Oh, no. So you're getting the, they may be a bee friendly <coughs> variety of plant or species, but the neonics and the bad things that are toxic to the bees are coming through. At least Home Depot has come out now and they actually mark their mm -hmm. plants and say that they have neonics and their GMOs. Mm -hmm. So if you go through a, a Home Depot, you can look at the tags and they'll be marked GMO. <coughs> I think a lot of times people buy things through catalogs and not thinking about the consequences of right. that type of thing. So, um, this yellow dandelion that I've somehow lost, um, but we all know what dandelions look like. Um, to a bee, that's what they're seeing. That's how the UV light reflects. So they're not seeing the red. They don't see the red spectrum at all. So when you're planting flowers in your garden and you plant red roses, <coughs> old-fashioned roses that are flat and have a good landing spot for them, the bees aren't seeing the red. That's for you. So you can plant things of many different varieties that will really, really attract the bees. Any questions about this? I got a quick question about GMO. Mm -hmm. So what is it about the GMO that causes the problem with the bee? Yeah. A lot of the GMOs are injecting foreign matters genetically modified. So they want a flower that's going to glow in the dark, so they will cross, cross it with a fish that glows in the dark. So now you have these fish genes in a plant that could be toxic. <coughs> they're using pesticides in, um, they're spraying, they're creating pesticides that help the plant be resistant to being sprayed by Roundup as an example. Roundup's a poison. When the bees, the, the poison moves its way through the plant into the pollen and nectar, when the bees take the food, they take it back to the hive. It, they survive long enough to get back to the hive, but then they start feeding the larva. So that's, that's one of the issues. Anybody else want to get in on the GMO thing? Well, it's not just the GMO, it's the synthetic parts. <laughs> it's systemic yep. pesticides too that you water around the trees and it's drawn up to the root system it does the same thing you know and it's the same with fertilizer you, you put it into the ground and it comes and it moves up through the plant that's just the way it grows what kind of fertilizer do you use I, I don't use well sometimes <laughs> I really don't fertilize anything I use compost I use compost exclusively if I need fertilizer, don't get me started on soils because that's my baby. <laughs> we'll go off into this land for a couple of hours. Um, I like to buy steer manure. I don't like to buy horse manure because horse people worm their horses and the, pest, the chemicals that they use for worming passes through the animal, goes into your soil, can kill the beneficial nematodes, worms, and all kinds of good things that are living in the soil. So I use steer manure that's been composted. Used to be able to buy it at Orchard, really, really reasonable. And that, that's what I use. And I use half as much, and I will put the steer manure on my, my vegetable bed in the fall if I'm not growing vegetables, and let the rain leach it into the <coughs> garden, and then come springtime, I'm ready to plant. What about chicken manure? Chicken manure is really, really hot. Uh, it is so loaded with nitrogen, but it is a very good source of nitrogen for your plants. It assimilates easy into the, into the, the system. One thing that we need to remember as gardeners is that clay, which is the bane of everybody in Santa Clara County, is essential to adjust the pH to make the fertilizers and the nutrients available to the plants. 
We did a research project at the old barracks site where we planted in native soil, half compost, and pure compost. And the biggest failure was the pure compost. We need the clay in our soil. So, and rabbit manure is very, very good, especially if you, um, if your rabbits are not fed a lot of um, stuff with uh, molasses in it. They, they put a lot of molasses in some of the feed for the rabbits. And so that sugar goes back in and it brings ants and other issues. Mike? Doesn't chicken manure have a lot of uh, undigested seed in it? Yes, as does steer manure and horse manure. So there's a lot of stuff that passes through. We had uh, someone brought into the extension office a couple of years ago. They had a weed that they'd never seen before. Wow. And it turned out that, oh, this is warm. <laughs> the uh, uh, farmer had brought in hay from Montana, oh. fed his horses. The horse planted the weed seeds with fertilizer and a whole new weed was brought into the valley. So we have a lot of that goes on. Sharon, mm -hmm. do you use uh, fish emulsion and worm castings? I use a lot of worm castings. I have a big worm box and um, that guano is very, very good. What I have a tendency to do when I'm planting things, if I'm planting seeds, I buy, um, I'm kind of hide my master gardener in that. I buy um, happy frog, happy frog soil is, and planting mix is the number one choice of marijuana growers. <laughs> <laughs> that stuff has everything in it. I mean, it'll get anything to germinate. It's fabulous. It's expensive, but you're not, you know, a 25 pound bag will last me the whole season. It's like 14 bucks. So um, I like to buy good potting mix when I'm starting my own seeds, which is traditionally what I do is grow my own vegetables from seed. Any other questions? So this is what the bee sees. That's what we see. That explains a little bit better. So this is borage. These are some summer flowers. Borage is a really good herb. It reseeds itself. The, the, the best thing about borage is it's a very practical and usable herb. And it's really, if it gets too big, it just comes out of the ground. There's no root base to it. So it's really easy to eradicate. It makes a good tea. I'm trying to keep up. These pictures don't match what's up on the screen. Now, when we talk about native cal, yes. If you have borage seed, when is the right time to plant it? Now. Now is if you have a greenhouse or a place that you can keep things um, from freezing. It froze down here last night, yep. right? Mm -hmm. We got to 33.1. Mm -hmm. uh, but we never got to 32 last. I live in Campbell, so. Um, so you can, you can scatter the borage seed now, or plant now. Right now, we're planting all the peppers are in six packs on heat pads. And the tomatoes will go in March. And I'm going to be in Australia in March and April. <laughs> so I figure when I come back, the soil will be warm enough that everything will take off really good. So these are California natives. The one issue I have with California natives is that they aren't California native bees. They're imported bees. Or as John Muir affectionately calls them, immigrants. <laughs> uh, they look beautiful. The California poppies, the bees love them. But come fall, I think this slide is here. Oh, no. Come fly, fall, that's all brown and looks really crappy. So um, natives are wonderful in your garden. And I know there's a big going native garden tour going on right now. It's everybody's on the you know native plant uh, bandwagon. But it really takes a lot of work to keep a native garden looking good. 
Anybody agree with, disagree with? <laughs> You're nodding back there. It's really hard. I think when they say native, they ought to say weeds. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, 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 a lot of people are ripping out their whole front yards, and there are better plants than just California natives. One of the things we find with the California natives, we put in, we didn't, we didn't space them closely enough together, so we have a lot of bark on the ground. Mm -hmm. That bark's about four years old now, and it's starting to wear through, so the dirt's showing, and we got mm -hmm. weeds coming out. So, if you're going to plant a native garden, or native plants, and you plant them to a high density. Yep. <clears throat> so this is a Matia poppy. You can see how beautiful that is, how inviting. That's a native plant. And they spread like crazy. And how big do they get? Man? Huge. They get like six or seven <laughs> feet tall. Yeah. So one thing I've learned as a master gardener, if it says on the plant that it gets 10 feet tall, believe them. Yeah. <laughs> we think, oh no, no. Believe I don't me. get 10 feet tall because I've got them in boxes oh. for the most part. Okay. These grow all along 280 on the way to San Francisco by Sand Hill Road. And they're beautiful. Here we have some roses. So the hybridized, what they do in the hybridizing is they, they hybridize the pollen out of the flower. So they can get more fragrance. But you can see if you're a bee, this, this plant right here is a rose. It's a native rose. It's, it's got a lot, it's a lot more receptive for the bees to land. Look at this poppy. And these poppies right here are, they grow like opium poppies. I mean, they spread like crazy in your garden. So when I was talking about the bee going down here to dig the hole to get the nectar, that's just what he's doing. This is a bat face plant. It's in bloom right now. Coneflowers and a dahlia. There's a dahlia farm in Coralitas. And I went there to look at some bulbs a couple of years ago. And there were thousands of bees on all the dahlias. And I, I never thought that they would go up. You have dahlias, don't you? I brought some. Everybody can take one home if they'd like. Mm -hmm. It's a tree dahlia. This is another dahlia. Almost beautiful. And the reason <coughs> we like get these colors <laughs> and these designs is because these bees are moving the pollen around and creating new flowers. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how many slides are on here. Clover's another thing mm -hmm. um, that's really, really a good winter crop. Vetch, um, we're growing fava beans right now, and they're starting to produce flowers that the bees are going after. But clover's a really, really, really good ground cover. It's really good to put nitrogen back into your soil. And um, crimson clover, we all remember that, right, over and over. <laughs> um, crimson clover is beautiful as a edge in your garden around your plants uh, and the bees love it you probably remember when you were a little kid they, the clover always had bees on it and this is a blanket flower on the left yeah those blank those are on my backyard those blanket flowers and uh, you know i cut those back the other day just because i was out there working they're getting so leggy but they were still producing flowers oh. in january mm -hmm. so that's I, I just think of that as a year-round flower at least in this area a lot they're of great the bees love them a lot of these slides are randy's by the way i stole them from them <laughs> <laughs> i didn't think i'd ever have to fess up to it but I guess I <laughs> okay here's some other some mallow which is very popular easy to grow um, I don't even know how to say that, but it's another bulb. Dill, dill's another really, 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 dill, fennel, any of those, they're broad blaze, great uh, base. They put out a nice, easy place for the plant, the bee, to get to the nectar and the pollen. That's our garden at Frush, by the way. That looks a little bit like California fuchsia. This right here? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's not. It's yeah. a bulb. And um, 
it reproduces like crazy and it's beautiful and it, it gets about this tall and um, it's just a beautiful beautiful plant and the hummingbirds love it even more than the bees and you, you know you're going to have issues with the hummingbirds and the bees fighting over things i i that's a good fight mm -hmm. Some yarrow. The yellow yarrow is the native yarrow, native to California. The yellow has been hybridized. And the euphorbia below. I don't know which one that is. Do you know which euphorbia that is? Hibiscus. So if you're a bee, which one looks easier to pollinate or to, right. to steal <laughs> to get your. Uh, from hibiscus are beautiful they're non-native but they will grow really really well in our area and contrary to popular belief they'll take full sun and um, low water and that's a, of course hollyhock and that comes in a million different colors this is uh, Randy's photo and it's I just think it's beautiful it's a beautiful plant, but I'll warn you that this is like the number one that'll spread and take over everything. I'm constantly, I would spend, a, I spend half a day over the weekend just tearing out the stuff I don't want. It's everywhere, absolutely everywhere. But it's pretty, and the, the bees love it. So sunflowers, I'm just checking the time. Oh, there's a clock on the wall. Um, sunflower family are they're probably the most popular, most successful when it comes to uh, a source of food. The giant sunflowers like this will have 30 and 40 honeybees on it at a time. Now our hives are located almost on Highway 101. We keep them at Prouche Park. Everybody know where Prouche is, mm -hmm. where the big red barn is? On um, 280, 680, 101. Our okay. hives are closest to the freeway and our, their food source is all the way across 10 acres to this garden that we have. But I can tell you those uh, sunflowers are covered with bees from the first day they open until we cut them. Uh, redbud is always good and ceanothus. Ceanothus is also known as the California lilac comes in about a thousand <coughs> colors and varieties. It's growing all over the place. Bless you. It's um, very, very popular. My experience with red bud is that the shape of the flower makes it very difficult for the bee to actually access um, the pollen. Thistle, artichoke, and Mexican sage. And they'll get in there. They'll, they'll work it hard to get those the, the nectar out of there. The number one plant we should all have in our garden right now is rosemary. And um, you can cook with it. I was I was out looking today, my neighbor has a rosemary and it's taken over the whole park strip and there must have been a thousand bees on it. And when, when you walk by, they don't even care. <laughs> so one thing I um, wanted to talk about as well is um, water. And I'm, I'm going to try to slip that in here. Uh, so our fruit trees are going to start blossoming pretty soon. And the, the honeybees are going to be responsible for the success or failure of how much fruit we produce, especially the cherries. And my neighbor has a big avocado. He depends on the hives that we have in our backyard to pollinate his avocado. And this is the sage over here. Another cianothus. They're just beautiful, but they're big. They're a big shrub. They can be very, very. If you take the is it Hewis Creek or Coyote Creek Trail, there's just a million of them up there. Onions. <coughs> Let's talk about how important they are to our vegetables. Tomatoes, like as, as I said before, not so much, 
But when you start getting into the melons and the cucumbers, the beans, the onions, critical, critical, critical. And garlic. Who knew, huh? Daphne, which I passed around in the lavender. <coughs> One thing about lavender is that the Varroa does not like the scent of lavender. Hmm. So if your bees are feeding on the nectar from lavender, they're bringing that scent back in on them into the hive, and it'll slow down <coughs> the Varroa problem. What I do with my water source, I have a basin, and I put lavender sprigs in the water. The bees use it to walk on water, if you will, but it helps with the varroa mite issues. You know, nature has a way. She's pretty smart. Another two varieties of lavender are lavender and liatrice to the right. This is summer at spring. So we talk about water. And we learned a very interesting thing. I, and the bees are going crazy for water right now. Have you noticed? They mm -hmm. just seem to be, they can't get enough water. And Robert, what did you read this morning to me from the, about the water, why they were going after the water? Are you asleep? I'm not asleep. <laughs> I'm trying to phrase my sentences correctly. It's like in a whole sentence. <laughs> um, that they are, coming back to the hive full of water, not necessarily to cool off the hive, which, would, which is their normal activity in the summertime. But this time of year, they're doing it to help liquefy the honey inside the hive so that they can then feed the uh, larva with it, diluted, if you would, to liquefy it. I never would have thought of that. Mm -hmm. The internet. So what actually happens, they put the honey away, then when they need it, well, so they put the honey away, they dry it. I don't know if you've ever seen the activity where they'll line up, the bees will line up on the landing board, and they're facing out, their wings facing in, and they'll just sit there and create a wind current through the hive. And what they're doing is drying the honey. Then they cap it for later use. Well, now it's later. And now it's dried or thick. And so they need to thin it out to make it easier to feed back to the larva. And that's happening now as they build up their columns. Don't be <coughs> adding water to our honey. <laughs> <laughs> be careful. You can make it ferment that way. <laughs> what? Be careful putting water in your honey. You can make it ferment that way. Oh, I think so. I don't put anything but I know what he's talking about. I put it in the jar and it just, and some plants will even, asters will make your honey crystallize sooner than not. Especially mm -hmm. ivy. Ivy too? So let's, I mean, we have a bee over here scrounging for water in the grass. Mm -hmm. That was at the hives. I noticed that it, at Proust, we don't have water basins out. It's really easy to do. I, I take a, a basin that goes under a flower pot, put some pebbles and rocks in it or leaves, and just put water in it and keep it clean, keep it fresh. And I year round, not just at this time of the year. Uh, duckweed on the pond, there's little surfboards for the uh, bees. <laughs> So um, I want to talk a little bit about, well, we've already really talked about it, but just be aware when you're buying plants and you're buying fertilizer, there is, you know, do you know what BT is? Bacillus thuringiensis is a chemical that they use to kill caterpillars. And a lot of people use it for tomato hornworms. And mosquito control. Which, by the way, is a beautiful moth that's about this big that is becoming extinct because everybody's killing <coughs> the, um, the caterpillars. How many people <coughs> run out of tomatoes in August and <laughs> September? Doesn't happen. So um, just be aware of if there are, uh, the University of California has now started in their books on pesticides and, and pest control 
the first thing they talk about is cultural controls, things that you can do without grabbing a spray bottle. As a master gardener, <coughs> we get calls every day. There's something eating my, I want to kill it. And you don't even know what it is. Uh, it could be your two-year-old, I don't know, or your dog, or your cat. Yeah, you know, so, cool. so before you run to the store and buy a bottle of seven, pay attention, figure it out. I, I, I'm taking you to cl a class in two weeks on the 10 aspects of being a good gardener. And the first thing is to observe. You have to be in your garden. You can be in your garden. You can see what your bees are eating. You, every day you should be out there looking to see what they're doing, what they're up to. Today, I swear to God, every bee in the hive was out. It was such a gorgeous day. It was just chaos. Um, and, but it was really nice because they've been cooped up. One thing we learned in Nova Scotia, they keep bees in Nova Scotia. Uh, Nova Scotia is the furthest point in, the, in, the, in Canada. It's minus seven degrees there right now. It's not the cold that kills the bees, it's the wet. They, keep, they leave their hives outside in this weather. They bunch them together, they'll throw a tarp over them, keep them dry, and they don't lose hives. They wrap them in bubble wrap. Bubble wrap. Four to a pallet, sometimes three to a pallet. Wrap them in bubble wrap, throw a tarp over them, and leave an entrance. It's okay. And let the snow pile up. <coughs> so this is what I was talking about, ortho uh, phasing out the chemicals. And this is, I'm glad this slide is here. See the little bee up in the corner? Mm -hmm. That's our indication that it's a bee-friendly plant. And it's good to know that our voices are being heard as beekeepers. And the beekeepers in California have seem to have the loudest voices in the nation. Uh, and the EPA is also requiring <coughs> notifications on their chemicals. <laughs> At least they were a year ago. I don't know what they're doing now. Yeah, they're repealing a lot of that now. Yeah, yeah. I don't even know if we have any issues anymore. Um, so, what I want to talk about before is my last, to leave you in an up state, is plants that you should be concerned with. That you really shouldn't um, encourage in your garden. It's bad enough that our neighbors have them. but. Um, I mean, they're beautiful azaleas, but you have to be aware. If you go onto the internet and you put plants toxic to bees, it will absolutely, you'll want to concrete your garden. No, you won't, trust me. But um, there are a lot of plants that are of concern. California buckeye is toxic to honeybees. That's why when you walk on the trail at Coyote Creek, or you'll see them in the Ceanothus, but you won't see them. They're smart enough to know to stay away from the, the buckeye. And it's beautiful. You would think, why aren't there any bees on it? Because they're too smart. Rhododendrons and azaleas are toxic to bees. When I say toxic, I don't mean it kills them. I mean it can, if it's their only source of food, it can cause havoc with your body. <coughs> Excuse me, but chances are they're foraging on a lot of other things. Right now, my neighbor's azalea is in, he's must have 10 of them, and they're all in full bloom, and they're absolutely gorgeous. But I noticed today when I was out there, my bees aren't going there. My bees are going after the succulents. Mm -hmm. This jade plant is totally covered with flowers. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that has more of than flowers is bees. I mean, it was amazing. The succulents out there that are just producing like crazy, and this little tiny plant, this little alyssum, can you see it? Mm -hmm. I mean, this alyssum is just covered with bees as well. So they're out there. So be aware. Oh, did I make it go too yeah. far? You guys should have told me what I was doing. <laughs> so rhododendrons, <laughs> azaleas, um, trumpet flower can cause root death. Mm -hmm. I have four in my backyard. That's my backyard, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the beauties of this plant is it likes to bloom at night. So it doesn't, uh, 
and the bees just don't seem to be interested in it at all. The heliconia, which grows in the islands, and the stargazer lily. Now, most lilies are not toxic to bees, but this one has been so hybridized that it is absolutely poisonous to bees. So you can grow Easter lilies and all the other kinds of lilies, but this puppy right here, and it's beautiful. And it, when you get a bouquet for Valentine's Day, I can guarantee you there'll be one of those in there. Bob Rosemary is acutely poisonous. Fortunately, we don't have that growing in this part of the state. Uh, amaryllis, the pollen can produce a toxic honey. Now, I have a couple of amaryllis, it's not a big deal. The guy around the corner has a whole hedge around his whole front yard that's about this wide. I, you know those bulbs are very expensive. Yellow jasmine, not the white jasmine that we grow here that's the vine that smells really strong. So, according to common poisonous plants of North America, these plants will produce can produce poisonous honey. Jimson weed, henbane, oleander. Oleander, we would have assumed that without. Four leaves of an oleander will kill a grown horse. <clears throat> so just be aware, when I see them planting the oleander all along the freeway, yeah. I just think, oh, if they just put ceanothus in, it's a much better plant for us. So there's some references I have. I had a sheet with all of this on. It's locked in the trunk of the car. <laughs> um, and some useful websites. A UC Davis IPM is a very good website. Of course, the Master Gardeners are always around. Randy's a Master Gardener. He knows all that stuff. Sandy's a Master Gardener. Uh, OK, I think that is about my talk. And we have a little bit of time. I'm open to questions. Yes, Mike. What type of plant is uh, Pride of Madeira? Oh, Pride of Madeira, it belongs in Texas. <laughs> it grows along uh, Highway 17 if you go over to San Francisco. It's the techie. love it. Yeah, the bees do love it. We, I can't have, I'm not having success with mine. It's a, it's a perennial, it's yeah. a shrub. It's a beautiful plant. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't, I don't think it likes the shade. I don't think our soil is so alkaline. Oh. And I think the further into San Andreas Mountains, the soil becomes acidic, and I think it really thrives on that acidic soil. Yes. I was just talking to Glenn Mars at the Madeira at Fruitdale, uh -huh. and he has a Pride of Madeira. He said too much Pride of Madeira uh, taints the honey. Really? It's not. It's not uh, good for people. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know much about the plant because like, we don't, I've just had no success with it whatsoever. I think it's a beautiful plant. We've got to know. Anybody else? For yes. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I got to went on a tour over uh, in the uh, grasslands there in Pajaro mm -hmm. and uh, signed up for I Naturalist. And they have uh, like a website where you can go on tours out there to show you all the different plants and stuff. But what I'm wondering is, is there some kind of app that you know of that you can take a picture of the plant and it will tell you or someone will tell you? Because iNaturalist will help you with a lot of plants. That's what I use is iNaturalist. And it's an app you can get for your phone and you can take a picture of an insect, a reptile, whatever. And you email it to them and within that fast, somebody will get back to you and tell you exactly what it is. Oh. It's amazing. I use it quite often, actually. It's iNaturalist. Yeah, another one that I use, that you just take a picture and put it up, is called Seek, S-E-E-K. And that, I've got that off an iPhone. I don't know if it's on Android or not. That's a really good application. It is. And you can either, you can either just, <coughs> you know, scan through it. You can either take a picture or if you have a picture uh, that you want to just get identified, either way, you can tell it on Seek, and most of the time it knows what it is. Or I have found occasions when I take a picture, 
that it looks at and isn't quite sure, but if I take from a different angle, a couple of different pictures, it usually figures it out 90, for, 90 plus percent of the time. So, um, you have a question, CNFS. CNFS, is it, do ticks like it? I've heard that. Well, ticks inhabit the area that it grows in. Okay. I don't think it's a favorite plant of ticks for that, but it's in that woodsy area. And, with, and the ticks are going to be, the winter seems to have been mild enough and produce enough grasses. I think ticks are going to be an issue this year. So, do, do you, are you guys still selling the, the seeds, the plants, the flower, bee seeds? Because a lot of the places, um, Renee's Seeds sells a package of seeds, bee plants. They're mostly uh, plants that they need to be seeded this time of the year or earlier. When I'm seeding like that into, the, into my garden, I usually will take about a gallon of soil potting mix, put the package of seeds in, stir it all up, and scatter it that way. That way the seeds are evenly dispersed and they're clinging onto something that'll make them easier to grow. Okay, I hope you got something out of it. I did. Thank you. Okay, so now you got me going here. Let's, um, <laughs> So applications for figuring out what plants are. Let me see if I can find them. Let me see. Uh, okay, you can do plantifier. You can use plant net. You can use, uh, well, leaf snap is not a really good one. It's mostly East Coast based, but you can take a look at it. Uh, you can use flower checker. You can use uh, garden answers. You can use seek, which I already suggested, and you can use plant snap. So all of those are iPhone apps which you can download from the iPhone store. I imagine most of them are on Android as well. And if you're interested in bugs and bees, you can do uh, picture insect. There's one. B plus is another. And wild bee ID if you're into native bees. So all of those are iPhone apps as well.